Good evening and welcome to the Week in Review. I'm Paris Schutz. We'll be joined by our Week in Review guests in just a moment, but first, some of today's top stories. A temporary Bally's Casino at Chicago's Medina Temple in River North will not cause major traffic snarls. That's the conclusion from a new traffic study commissioned by Bally's, the company that won the bid to be Chicago's casino operator. City transportation officials say they believe the study indicates River North will be able to handle the added traffic from a temporary casino. But downtown alderman Brendan Riley told the Chicago Tribune he believes the study is seriously flawed. The casino will be there at the landmark location while Bally's builds a permanent home on the site of the Chicago Tribune printing press. Hurricane Ian has been downgraded to a cyclone hours after it slammed into the shore of South Carolina. The storm devastated parts of the Florida West Coast as a Category 4 hurricane. Still has the potential for high winds and flash flooding in the Carolinas. The Associated Press reports the U.S. death toll from Ian right now stands at 17. An honorary street naming for the late former Chicago Teachers Union President Karen Lewis. CTU leaders unveiled the new honorary street sign at the corner of Carroll and Damon today. That's where the union's headquarters are. They called Lewis more than a union leader, but someone who inspired a movement. Karen Lewis died last year after a long battle with cancer. And now we go to our Week in Review panel. Joining us are Chuck Gowdy, Chief Investigative Reporter for ABC7 Eyewitness News, Mike Flannery, Political Editor at Fox 32 News, Nader Issa, Education Reporter for the Chicago Sun-Times, and our own Heather Sharon. So let's get right into it. Mike Flannery, the mayor, late this week announces she is going to do away with the $42 million inflation-tied property tax increase that had been planned. Uh, is this really because uh, the economy is so great and revenues are coming in better than expected, or is it that it's an election year and she's got a lot of pressure to have some good news for taxpayers? Well, uh, I think the latter. Uh, February 28th is coming up fast. Uh, the uh, filing uh, deadline is not until November, but uh, the campaign is in full-throated war cry in some respects. And that's why she's canceling this tax increase. Yeah, Heather, a couple months ago, she kind of downplayed it, saying it's not that big a deal for homeowners. It's like going to uh, Al's Beef and getting uh, some extra cheesy beefs for a family of four, even though I've never heard of cheese on beef. I guess it is a thing uh, people have told me. But anyway, why is she reversing now? Well, the fact of the matter is, is that this proposal was dead on arrival at the city council. Not only is the mayor running for re-election, but all of the aldermen, at least those who have decided to run for re-election, will also face the voters in February. And nobody wants to ask for people's votes only after having approved a property tax increase in a year when the city's deficit is the smallest it's been since 2019. That was a non-starter. And the the fact that the mayor made this announcement three days before she set to unveil her budget proposal tells you just how unpopular it really was. This budget deficit, $170 million, the smallest since 2019. That, of course, was Mayor Lightfoot's first year. Chuck Gowdy, uh, you've seen a lot of these mayoral cycles, budget cycles. It seems like it plays out this way every single time in the election year. The budget deficit is small, so the mayor can say, look at what a great job we did with the fiscal ship. And then the first year after the election, it's, it's really high. It, it, do you put a whole lot of stock in these numbers? Well, I don't put much stock in any numbers that come out of any city of Chicago agency because they've been flawed for decades. And what is happening with the, you know, this this tax deal? It's the 1945 city of Chicago fifth floor playbook. I mean, it's the same thing all the time. And what it does is produces an electorate that just doesn't care. And you know, those who do turn out, uh, you know, some of them decide ahead of time who they're going to vote for, but. It's all part of the, the same drill that we've heard year after year after year. They change the players. Some of the parts are interchangeable, but uh, a lot of people just don't care about this. Well, we'll have to see what that deficit is next year, and the city still has pension funds that are massively uh, underfunded. Nader Issa, the mayor, will deliver her budget address on Monday. How do you think she uh, will go about uh, closing that budget gap? Well, she's going to have to work with aldermen, work with the city council, see what they'll what they'll vote for, what um, they can can vote for to get reelected to. She'll have some tools at her disposal. Um, I mean, same type of stuff she's used in the past. 
um, scrap together money here and there, but it's it's going to be uh, a, a, an a easier easier decision, easier uh, uh, task than past years, obviously. In, in past years, we hear things like zero-based budgeting, finding efficiencies, a lot of these phrases that I'm not sure exactly what they mean, uh, but that, that's usually what we hear when mayors talk about closing their budget gap. But, Mike, uh, there's this WGN poll out this week that shows Governor Pritzker with a pretty commanding lead over his challenger, Darren Bailey, 51 to 36 percent. Uh, you had a poll out uh, a little earlier showing that race really close. Uh, what, what, well, it was, you, that, that was a seven-point margin, and that was an internal uh, Bailey campaign paid-for poll uh, that, had, uh, that had a series of leading questions that were asked about issues before they got to the Q&A. Uh, this, this Emerson uh, uh, College Institute poll that you're talking about uh, didn't do that. It, it did... Uh, m m it, it asked about the the horse race before uh, plumbing other issues. So it's it's a much more honest and reliable survey. Now the question is: um, Is there, as we have seen uh, across the country, um, is there um, are, are there conservatives, uh, older white voters, and uh, older white men in particular who aren't going to participate in the survey or aren't going to give accurate answers in the era of Trump? Uh, that that's been one factor. Uh, in in why polls have have been off in some recent elections. Do you do you do you trust the accuracy of this poll, Mike? I, I think it's a straightforward survey. And uh, look, I, I do think that uh, that J. B. Pritzker and Juliana Stratton are uh, are have a significant lead. I mean, even that survey from inside the Bailey campaign um, had Pritzker with a seven point lead and a net positive favorable, unfavorable rating with the voters, while Bailey himself, his own poll showed Bailey was 10 points upside down, a net 10 point negative with the voters. And, and that, as you mentioned, that poll had some very uh, leading questions to try and produce perhaps a more favorable result uh, for the Bailey campaign. Uh, Heather, uh, this despite the fact that uh, the airwaves are inundated with ads uh, criticizing Pritzker on crime and especially the Safety Act, the No Cash Bail Act that goes into effect next year. Is this a sign that those ads aren't making a dent in this race the way that Bailey and his supporters might want? Because they've gone all in on this issue of crime. They should sure have. The WGN poll, I thought, was really interesting on this issue because it showed that voters' top concern was not crime but economy. And, of course, that poll showed Pritzker and Stratton leading by more than 10 points. So I think it's an open question whether Bailey's full-throated focus on crime is going to pay off for him. We're also at a time where crime is certainly not where it was before the pandemic, but it's lower than it was a year ago, which complicates the message that Bailey has been trying to hammer home. I also think that he has been in a little bit of a pickle with his messaging on Chicago. First, it was a hellhole. Then it was not a hellhole. Then it was a great city. And now Chicago is apparently a Raquel recalcitrant child who needs a little bit of help. So that is complicating that message as well. And it's not clear what will motivate voters to go to the polls in just about 50 days. I, I believe the exact uh, phrasing used today was unruly child. Chuck Sorry. Gowdy, uh, when you want to be governor <laughs> of Illinois and you constantly say that the, the biggest city in the state is a, either a hellhole or a, an unruly child, I mean, is there a, a method to his madness here? Well, I think that the first question is, I mean, why would anybody want to be the governor of Illinois, much less the mayor of Chicago under the current conditions? The, I know there are, there, there are lineups with people waiting for that, but um, the, 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 the difficulty here is that crime may be down a tick or two, but it's hitting closer to home for a lot of people. And I think on election day, even though the pollsters might have been told that it's the economy, at least in the city of Chicago, uh, the crime issue is going to be is going to be foremost in people's minds. So we'll we'll see if that does indeed have a, an effect when people do go to the polls. Uh, Mike Flannery, uh, the mayor also announced this week uh, she wants to change uh, the financial district, uh, LaSalle Street. She wants to reinvent it uh, as a more of a residential area. Let's take a look. Since the turn of the century, this historic corridor has been an economic engine for our city home to office buildings, retail, theaters, and dining. 
But we all know now that the pandemic and cultural shifts have brought steep challenges to this corridor, especially over the last couple of years. Changes in where we work and where we shop have left this corridor with nearly 5 million square feet of vacant commercial space. Right, this has been a problem for years in the loop, vacant commercial space. City planners have said it needs to reinvent itself as more of a mixed-use area. So she's offering incentives here for developers to come in, and especially if they make 30% of these new units affordable housing, do you think they'll bite? Well, yes, and this didn't originate with uh, Mayor Lightfoot. I mean, this is, this is uh, uh, Paris, the... Uh, the landlords, the, the building owners uh, along that uh, historic LaSalle Street corridor responding, um, their, their, their bottom line is bleeding cash. A, a, a survey for the Chicago Loop Alliance recently found that only 48% of the pre-pandemic office workers, uh, about 350 to 400,000 people, you know, only about 48%, half of them are back in the office. Um, uh, th th there have been other studies indicating 14 or 15 percent of the jobs that were in the loop are gone forever. Uh, these are people who are now working from home or they're working from Montana with, with a mountain view uh, out there picture window. Um, and so the landlords have to do something. And it was interesting, Maurice Cox, the city planning and development commissioner, said at that news conference that you pulled that soundbite from, from the mayor, um, that uh, left uh, to their own devices, uh, it, it le left to the market, um, the uh, the landlords, the building owners are going to come up with uh, with very very expensive condos. What the mayor wants to do is is throw some taxpayer dollars in there to make uh, uh, building owners who bite on this uh, set aside 30 percent of their units for affordable housing for low and moderate income folks. Um, and w what does that mean? That means that you're not spending more than 30% of your income uh, on, on rent or the mortgage payment, uh, you know, on, on housing. Um, so uh, this is not necessarily going to have a big impact on that 5 million uh, square feet that are vacant, but something's got to be done. Something's got to be done there. This is the most valuable real estate uh, in the city, and uh, and as you mentioned, uh, these landowners are, are bleeding, landlords are, are bleeding cash here. Uh, I want to move on to another contentious issue this week. Nader Issa, the Chicago School Board, narrowly approves plans for a new near Southside High School amid intense opposition from a lot of folks, including a state lawmaker who initially was supportive of the idea. Remind us why this has become such a flashpoint. Well, the idea for the school isn't new. This is something the, the Chinatown community, people on the near south side have been discussing, talking about for 20 years. There was a big, uh, big proposal a few years ago, about five, six years ago, to change one of the near south elementary schools, uh, close it, convert it to a high school. A judge ended up blocking that plan. And right now, the, the idea, the newest idea is to build a high school on former public housing land on the near south side. The former Harold Ickes homes, uh, they were closed about a decade ago. Promises were made to old residents that they, they had a right to return. And the CHA, the Chicago Housing Authority, had a plan to build um, a sort of mixed, mixed income project right there on around 24th and state, 23rd and state. Even the advocates who are strongest in support of a new high school on the near south side have come out opposing the plan as it stands. They don't want to upset their neighbors by building a school on former public housing land. They have a few other sites identified that they'd like to, the, the school to go on to. And then there's also the concern about the nearby uh, neighborhood schools, Phillips Academy, Tilden, Dunbar. These are historically black schools. They've historically served black students. Over the years, they've uh, bled funding and students. And the worry now is you open a shiny new building a mile away, they're going to lose more students, more, stu uh, more funding, and they'll eventually close. And that's a worry that advocates uh, have, have shared. It's even a worry that some Chicago Public Schools officials shared confidentially last year 
but the mayor and, and CPS CEO Pedro Martinez, they've they've shared a very different story publicly. But Nader, and these concerns were aired at the school board meeting. Isn't part of this also the fact that advocates in Chinatown have long wanted a high school there, dual language high school, um, either uh, Chinese or Cantonese and uh, English. And this proposal is on the other side of the Dan Ryan. It would not be near Chinatown. Is that part of the opposition, at least from a state uh, lawmaker, Teresa Ma? Yeah, so Teresa Ma, um, she's, she's the state lawmaker who a couple of years ago pushed through $50 million in funding in the state uh, capital budget for this project. She, this, this week, uh, said she's pulling the funding. She's going to withhold the funding because of all the reasons we've we've already talked about it and the location isn't isn't close enough to chinatown um they want it closer to 18th and canal they've uh they've said maybe the 78 the the new development on the near south side in the south loop so there's there's different options that have gone out there cps at, at their board meeting this week said they explored 16 different locations and for various reasons they they don't think they're viable so they're pushing ahead with uh, with the 24th and state location, even though the, the strongest backers of the school don't want it there. So this uh, $50 million in state funding for the school, Heather, is being held up right now. But will CPS go forward even if they don't get that money? Well, yes, the Board of Education, which are uh, the members are all appointed by the mayor, voted four to three to spend $15 million to begin the process of designing this school. Now, that vote incredibly narrow, only passed because Mayor Lightfoot removed Dwayne Truss, a member that she appointed all the way back in 2019 and replaced him with former Alderman Michael Scott. Michael Scott favors the school, Dwayne Truss opposed it and called for an inspector general investigation into the, the damage that it could do to nearby historically black schools. So that is a clear indication that the mayor is all in on this location, all in on this high school. And it's an election year, so we are going to keep hearing about this. This plan also relies on nearly $7 million in tax increment financing funding, which must be approved by the Chicago City Council. So this is just the first in what's going to be a long series of fights over this particular proposal. And certainly something the mayor wants in an election year, uh, as we've talked about uh, many times on this show tonight. Chuck Gowdy, uh, this is the 40th anniversary of the Tylenol murders uh, that ha that basically rocked the entire nation, but especially the Chicago region uh, 40 years ago this week. Uh, do you have any reason to believe that uh, prosecutors might soon finally have a case uh, against a suspect here, and, and the suspect that, that everyone keeps naming is James Lewis, who was uh, convicted of extortion around this case several years ago. Well, Lewis has been the one and only suspect since nearly day one. Uh, investigators throughout the you know, the first 24 hours, and then when they when they built the extortion case uh, against Lewis and sent him to prison, they continued to say that in addition to being an extortionist, they believe that he actually is the Tylenol killer. And as, as recent as a, a couple of days ago, the people who were involved in that continue to say the same thing. What has changed over the last few months or so is that they have taken fresh eyes and looked at the original evidence. And there apparently are some pieces of new evidence that have come up. They haven't disclosed whether that's witnesses, documents, something Lewis said to a friend at a bar, what it may be. But there, there's a great deal of optimism here that has not existed at any point over the 40 years that they may well be able to charge James Lewis in state court with the murders, essentially. Of all of them, one of them, doesn't matter. They want Lewis to pay the price for this because they think that he's been out free talking about it, essentially making money off of it, books and websites for all this time. And, and they want to get him into court before a judge and, and prosecute him. And, and, and the extortion case, I mean, basically he was convicted because he wrote this letter to Johnson & Johnson basically saying he was going to poison the pills with cyanide. So, so why has it been so hard to have enough evidence then to bring murder charges? Well, part of the problem is that it happened 40 years ago. If this crime had happened today, James Lewis in all likelihood would have been put before a judge charged with murder and there, there would have been um, a tweaking of the evidence. 
that wasn't the case 40 years ago. The DNA, the forensic science was not there. And so what you had was the best case that the authorities could make with that letter to Johnson & Johnson. Uh, it was kind of in your face. But beyond that, you had, you had James Lewis explaining exactly how these murders occurred to anybody who would listen with very detailed diagrams saying you split the, the capsules in half, mm -hmm. you use a pegboard and you put the cyanide into it, repackage it, put it back on the shelves. Of course, Lewis has maintained um, somewhat seriously, at least, that uh, he was trying to help the authorities with this and that he was a good citizen. Nobody on the investigative team ever believed that. They don't believe it now. And there's, there is a reason to believe that they may be coming close uh, to charging James Lewis at some point in the next uh, month, two months, six months, whatever. Of course, the clock is running. Lewis doesn't appear to be in great health. Um, will they ever take him to court? I don't know. I think that uh, it really will come down to looking at the calendar and the chronology of this. And, and certainly prosecutors want to have an airtight case here when you bring charges like that. Uh, Chuck, I'll stick with you, uh, you here. The, the CPD announced earlier this week it's going to start encrypting communications uh, over the police scanner. And so then the audio is not going to be available as it happens immediately. It's going to be available 30 minutes later and it could right. be redacted. Uh, is this going to hurt the efforts of reporters and onlookers that just want to know, you know, what crime is happening right now? Well, well it, it actually has been underway um, behind the scenes for at least a year. And we started hearing about this plan because some other cities have done the same thing, encrypting radio communication. Uh, the, the claim is that the police departments need to do this for security. They don't want criminals to be able to hear what's happening as they're, as they're plotting how they uh, are going to pull a crime off and how the police are going to respond to it. But you talk to people who, um, at least in the city of Chicago, are really fired up about this, to borrow Mike's term. They are angry because they think that communities are going to end up on the short end of this thing. The police response times are terrible and getting worse. And if you can't listen to the police scanners, you don't know, for instance, that it's going to take 60 minutes or 90 minutes or two days for police to show up at, at, in some cases, even a violent crime. And so there is a point of view there among many community leaders that this is just part of a grand scheme by CPD to cover their tracks. I know a lot of groups that like the ACLU are really worried about this and the, and the transparency implications. Uh, Mike Flannery, since we don't have a sports reporter this uh, week, we're, we're gonna uh, send this question to you, long-suffering White Sox fans. Uh, uh, there are reports that Tony La Russa is gone after this year. He's taking care of his health. What else has to change in the offseason? They've got to get some fire. I mean, this was a, this was a group of gifted athletes uh, who... Well, you have some you can send them. Uh, yeah, I sh yeah, I'll, 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 ship a, I'll ship a bit of this graphic. I, I was telling <laughs> Chuck earlier he could set a fire behind himself there. But um, look... Uh, what happened, uh, there, there's a professor I know at the University of California, Irvine, who's one of these uh, uh, sabermetrics nerds. Um, he, he, he has an amazing statistic. <clears throat> the White Sox swing at, uh, th this past season, they, they swung at pitches that were far out of the strike zone, um, far more than any other team in Major League Baseball. Uh, you know, and, and that was just one symptom. Look, there were a lot of injuries. Now, is that the fault of the trainer? Um, they, and, and, but from where I sit as a long-suffering fan, uh, I think Rick Morrissey had it so right in, in that piece that he wrote about uh, this, this is a team that in its disappointment that it delivered to the fans uh, stands all alone. They're in a category all by themselves. Um, there, there were guys, there were national sports prognosticators at the beginning of this season who uh, had them in the World Series. Um, and here they are finishing below 500. It's pathetic. I might, I might uh, add in that the 2004 Cubs might make a run at that title, uh, too, as a long-suffering Cubs fan. Nader East, I know you're a long-suffering Bears fan along with myself as well. Uh, Justin Fields struggles. Do you believe he can pull out of this against the Giants? We sort of have to believe it, right? I, what else can we hang our hat on? We we Bears fans don't have much hope otherwise. So, yeah, he's going to throw for 400 yards, throw <laughs> a few touchdowns, no picks. Uh, yeah, we, why not?
and, and it's going to be an awful game though the giants have a lot of weapons out the bears have some injuries it's not going to be a fun watch well you're really optimistic for having been a bears <laughs> fan for your whole life nader i guess uh uh, the, straight on to the Super Bowl, and uh, we are out of time right now, so our thanks to Chuck Gowdy, Mike Flannery, Nader Issa, and Heather Sharon. And that is our show for this Friday night. Don't forget you can get Chicago Tonight and the Week in Review streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com slash news. And be sure to join us tomorrow night at 6 for Chicago Tonight Latino Voices, then immediately after that, Chicago Tonight Black Voices at 6.30. And then we're back at 7 o'clock all next week, and you won't want to miss that. Now for the Week in Review, I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and have a great weekend. Closed captioning is made possible.